And the fact that I am using a makeup story as the foundational point metaphor that I'm using here nice. is kind Foundation. of hyster- oh, oh, check nice. me out. I oh, wish no. I, oh, darn it. I wish I could claim I did that on purpose. Fooey. Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. <laughs> and inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. I'm Elliot. And uh, a special thanks to Kelly, who has yes. been com- who has launched off a couple conversations on our Facebook page. Each week, our episode posts to our the So Here's My Story page on Facebook. And we've had a couple interesting conversations sparked there. So thank you, Kelly. And for those who chimed in on those, feel free if you're listening to this episode and you have a thought or a comment that you want to share, um, that's a great place to start the conversation or... Let us know you hated it. I don't know. <laughs> right. Let us know you hated <laughs> Worst it. Worst episode ever. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. And this is episode number what? 94. 94, which yeah. means that I we know. are coming bum, up bum, on bum. episode 100. And we, and I would love to say we had a really brilliant, fantastic plan of how to celebrate that, but, right. but we don't. So if you have ideas, we're going to come up with something. We are, but um, we sure could use your help. So if you have any thoughts on what we should do for our 100th episode, let us know. Yeah, because that'll be cool. Yeah, there you go. All right. So we're going to launch into Jody's story, which starts with her wandering in looking for makeup, which, as you know, that is comical in and of itself. Hey. But, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's fair. It's a fair but comment. But then her story veers into lipstick and gets us into the foundation of business. I know. I really stretched for that. But you I did. You did. It's my only makeup pun. Foundation of business. And, and making sure that your business is the right, you're, that you're accentuating the right things in that your That you're business. accentuating the right things. And um, we talk about a lot of things, and, and uh, some of which, especially with the beginning of Jody's story, gets me out of my comfort zone. So, you ready to go? Off we go. So here's my story. Earlier this week, I went into Ulta, which is like a makeup and uh, beauty kind of shop or whatever, which I immediately find intimidating. Right, I, I know that's where you <laughs> like to hang around. I know. I know. I, I'm just, they're like, can we help you? I'm like, you have no idea how much help I need. But I, I just, I get very basic things. Most of my makeup, I actually get at like CVS. But there are a few things that I like to get a different kind of thing for. So anyway, I go into Ulta. I almost always need help because I either don't know what I'm looking for. I'm terrible at picking colors. And I had two funny stories. I'm going to tell them both. Only the second one, I think, actually has a business metaphor with it. But I think they're both so hysterical. I'm going to tell you the other one anyway. So okay. the first thing that happened was <laughs> this lady said, um, can I help you with something? And I said, yes, please. I'm, I'm terrible at picking colors. And I was looking at eye makeup because I sing in the band. And sometimes when I'm getting ready for a gig, there's this want in me to like do something more, more interesting with my eye makeup. Although me doing eye makeup is a riot um, because I can get one eye looking in and I try to do the other one and it looks nothing like the other eye. And so I don't even know why I was trying, but I, you know, whatever. I was playing at the store. Right. (laughs) And I said, so I just, I could use some help because I always buy the wrong colors. And she says to me, she goes, oh, and she was so sweet, so sweet, trying to be helpful. She says, oh, don't worry. She goes, oh, don't be so hard on yourself. Those darker shades you used in like the crease of your eyelid are perfect for you. Ooh, that's a tough... Right, right. Be- yeah. Because, um, as you might know, like, I am only wearing mascara. <laughs> so, so, like, I'm not wearing eye makeup. And, um, which, you know, sounds very self-deprecating, but it's it's actually not. I mean, lucky me, I don't have to put on eye makeup there because I've got these... That's exactly what you're supposed to do, apparently, with eye makeup is put sort of darker purplish mauve... And there you go. ...in the creases. And they're the perfect colors for me because they're my skin colors. So, that that one I just think is funny. But then... This is the part that I think actually has some relevance to business potentially, or I hope. Otherwise, we may have to do it in a, a, short a different episode. story. It's a very short episode. So then we move over into lip color because of late, I always see these like pictures of almost like the, um, I forget what decade, like the 40, wherever they were, like the really red lipstick, mm-hmm. you know, like that era. And I love that I think that you see era. that World War II photos. Yes, yes. Those like World that, War II yeah. photos with the really red lipstick and not a lot of eye makeup. And, you know, I just, I love that look. And so- Across the course of my entire life, I've tried to find like the right reddish lipstick and a lot of reds because of my skin color look re- like if they have too much orange in them, they look gross on me. So again, I have a really hard time picking the reds and she was so good with color. I thought this is my chance to get the right red for me. And um, so we're picking, we're playing around, we're picking colors 
And she pulls out this red that we like tested. And I'm like, this is the right color. I could just tell when she put it on my hand, this is it. This is my red. And I get really, really, really excited. And she puts it on and I have the exact same reaction I always do once I have red lipstick on my lips, which is I immediately hate it. And I, and it looks, it just looks so, so, so wrong. (laughs) That is when I had the epiphany that it is actually not the lip color. It's my lips. (laughs) Because here's why. Here's why. So, uh, like, again, this is not a self-deprecating thing. And this is why I think it... And I'll I'll sort of provide you with the... uh, I can see the panic in your eyes. So, I will provide you the business metaphor I I see coming. I when you started talking about makeup. So I know. I know. I know. I know. So, here's what's interesting. Every time you see those amazing pictures, or especially the ones you see, like, in the, in the, the beauty section now or whatever, these women have these really lush, puffy, like, really pouty lips or whatever. And I have very thin lined lips. And when you put whatever color, even the perfect color red on thin lips, it just draws attention to this like little line across my face. It will never, I will never suddenly be Salma Hayek <laughs> when uh, well, I put red lipstick on. So a few or, of us you know, will or, be. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But so here's the, I don't tell that story to like make fun of my own lips or whatever. They're my lips. Um, and I'm fine with them. Um, Here's what I think is interesting. How often, because as I was driving home laughing about this story, because they just cracked me up. I'm like, it's not the lipstick. It's almost like the, the, the sort of version of it's not you, it's me. It's, it's not you, lipstick. It's my lips. Um, how often we like apply solutions to things because they're like the solutions of the moment. And like right now, I kept seeing these pictures mm-hmm. of these amazing, beautiful red lips on things. And, and it's, and like you, but your business has the wrong lips for that. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like somebody else's social media extra, you know, that somebody else is doing something with, that's working really well on their website or in their marketing or in their application. And yeah, you can take that and you can apply it to your thing and it can be the perfect color for you. But at the end of the day, it's not the right thing to be accentuating on your business. Like drawing attention to my lips is not my makeup strategy <laughs> that I should be be trying to follow. And um, so anyway, that was the, the thought I had. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because I ran into um, something like this just a couple of days ago. This is not the lip shaming part of our episode, but um, <laughs> I was working on, and you know, I've been working on a website for the speaking facet of what I do, mm-hmm. but so much of the speaking facet of what I do is tied up into law. That's my main credential. And so I speak about contracts and negotiations and all that stuff. Sure. And so I was talking to the designer that's working with me on this. And she said something akin to the fact that, you know, a lot of event planners, a lot of uh, these meeting organizers are drawn to something that's a little lighter. So I think that we should make it, uh, put an emphasis on design that's a little bit more playful. <laughs> and she used that word. She used the playful word. Now, I, you know, I joke around and all that stuff. But no, you're you're funny I'm and just, you're clever and witty, but you ain't playful. I'm not, you know, playful you're just didn't. <laughs> and I was talking to her about this, and I was like, "Well, you know, playful, playful doesn't really doesn't really capture what I think <laughs> I bring to the table." I'm and, gonna really struggle to get back on track because just you and the word playful is. <laughs> It's just I, not the right word. I have this this thought that you're low key insulting me right now, but <laughs> but the um, but the point was she had her solution. Her solution, which was right now, playful playful is in. is in. Yeah, yeah. Event planners and all that. So if we put this playful gloss <laughs> over the lawyer part of what you're bringing, we'd, oh we'd be able to really capitalize so on everything. My immediate image is like images of you doing those like jump in the air Jazz pictures. Jazz hands. <laughs> yes. Glitter. You with pup- puppies. <laughs> or like, oh my God, that's that would be a night. And the thing is like playful, it's the, thank you. That is exactly what I'm getting at. Like playful may be in. It may be the hottest ticket in town. That may be exactly what these people are looking for. But if we dress for. you in playful, people may not know why they're uncomfortable but looking they would at your be website. Uncomfortable. <laughs> but they'd yes. be like, oh, something about this doesn't feel right. Absolutely like- <laughs> right. And it does remind me, I have a... Um, uh, I won't say a friend because we don't know each other well, but I I know this person. He's a lawyer and he comes on stage in a full suit that is playful. It's like orange and yellow question marks. And, oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know, it looks like to me, it looks like a clown outfit. Sure. But I never understood that. Because, but what he wanted to do was really go 
all in sure. on gimmicky and quirky and playful and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And to me, I just can't no. see it. No. But um, but yeah, that's that's the solution that she had to the problem of well, how to design a website for what I bring. Yeah. And the the difficulty was she decided on the solution first. Right, right, right. Well, so it's funny. I um you know, when I get asked to do like to facilitate strategic planning sessions, and I may have even told this story previously, but um, but I'm gonna tell it again. Um I, I come in at very different parts of the plan. Like rarely have they not put any thought into it already. You know, they've already mm-hmm. got some ideas brewing and sometimes I have to decide how worth it it is to try and if it doesn't feel like the right thing, do we back up and try and, and do something else? But we, I was, I was facilitating one, one time and they had it on, they had done a bunch of research already. And I think they'd even worked with another consultant somehow. And um, so they were starting off with this, preconceived idea and preset idea that the thing they needed to be doing uh, for this one initiative was something that was n- not unlike, I don't need to go into all the details, but it was not unlike cold, having the board cold call a bunch of people. And it wasn't really cold calling, but point being the board was going to have to be reaching out to a lot of people individually, mm-hmm. um, one way or the other. And I can't even remember what the purpose of it was, but all I remember, the part that I recall vividly, was as every time the conversation came around to that part of the initiative in this plan that they were crafting, um, you I wish I'd had like a time lapse video because you could just see people kind of like melting down and they're like slurking down oh, into their yeah. chairs. You could just feel the, the energy of cold calling out of the room. Yeah, every time. And, and, and to be fair, it wasn't straight up cold no, calling, but you. that's yeah. how it felt to them. And right. all I remember was just uh, like trying to stay focused and being distracted by like the, almost like the oxygen sucking out of the room every oh, time we wow. came back around to it. Yeah. So I was, and this was, this was actually early on in my facilitation and I wasn't as, as confident about hitting pause in those moments because, mm-hmm. you know, I came into this, I'm, I have to, I have to absorb a lot of information very quickly. I might have opinions about things, but sometimes there are things I don't know about. So I don't always presume if it seems like a bad idea to me that I know it's a bad idea. No. But so I was like, do I really want to tell them their baby's ugly? Like, I don't, right. I don't know yet. Like, um, so I, I said, okay, pause for a second. Um, I'm just going to point out what I'm noticing here. You know, it seems like you would all rather like have your fingernails nails pulled off than actually go do this thing. And everyone kind of sat up and they said, yeah, I mean, this just, this, like, we, per- we don't like do we don't want to do this. I, personally, this seems awful and whatever, but, and they just kept really leaning into this, but this is best practices, you know, every other organization like ours has had enormous success when they did this, or this is how, you know, these other two people who are trying to do something similar to us, they really were able to blow it out of the water once they did this thing or whatever it is. And I was like, I, I get that. I hear you. I don't doubt that that is true. But what I can tell you right now, pretty predictively, is if we go ahead with this, you, you're not going to make your calls. And so the next five board meetings will be somebody trying to hound people about why they haven't made their calls. And if you do make your calls, you're going to do it with that tone in your voice. That's like, hi, sorry. You know, I just, I, you know, I hate to bother you. Probably don't even want to talk to me anyway, but right, you know? but you'll check the box, <laughs> but you'll check the box and it's, it's not going to blow it out of the water for you. I can almost guarantee you, you will not get the same results based on the energy I'm seeing here. And I said, can we at least just brainstorm some other ideas? And so we played around with a few things and somebody made a crack about like a bourbon tasting or something and everyone laughed and we kept, but I wrote it down and we kept coming around. And at the end of the day, to make a very long story short, they ended up trying this like series of like quarterly bourbon tasting parties kinds of things, which had, which seemed very off the wall, but has actually gotten them the result that they were because they were, it, I, I don't you need to go into all the details of it. But point being, it was fun. They were super into it. They were excited about it. And so they did the work. And yeah. so t- to me, there's this really interesting distinction of it's not that it doesn't matter that right now playful is hot. Because it it does. It's it's not that that is irrelevant, but you. But it's almost like sometimes the next part of the conversation is missing. Of like, but does playful work for Elliot, or well, would this thing work for that team? Right. But you know, there's there's also some, um, I won't say emotional baggage that goes along with this, but there it is um, kind of a loaded concept because part of me thinks not just on the playful, but on on anything. Part of me thinks that people don't want to be um, painted as someone who's unwilling to get out of their comfort zone. 
Yeah. Right. So people will say, well, I know this is your comfort zone, but maybe you should be willing to go mm-hmm. out and I know it wasn't precisely cold calls, but make these cold calls. Mm-hmm. Or when somebody, when, when I, I went and I wanted to get um, a suit or whatever, or a sport jacket for, for speaking. And I was talking to Chris Schaefer, who I love. And he's like, well, why don't you try this? Or why don't you try that? Well, he's a clothes guy. Right. And he's putting things on me. And, <laughs> and he's like, you, you might want to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and be a little bit bolder and mm-hmm. be a little bit this and be a little bit that. And, and I get that there's a value mm-hmm. to being willing to explore something outside of the, the narrow context of what you've already done. Absolutely. But you still <laughs> but not get taking into, you into like some crazy. Right. Crazy so what's that balance? Because maybe if they had done the calls, I think it would have worked out exactly as you described. They would have done it. They would have checked the boxes. They would have been reluctant to do it. It would have been a lot of foot dragging and they wouldn't have explored what actually worked for them that they got excited about, which was the bourbon tasting. Yeah. You know, I think it could. Yeah. Sorry. But the other part of it is (laughs) that if you're always going to say, well, I'm not going to do this because it's outside of my comfort zone, then you possibly do prevent yourself from exploring something that could really work. Well, I think that is that is the distinction, though, because there's sort of there's I won't say there's two kinds of resistance. Well, maybe I do say kinds. It can be there be two different kinds or two layers to resistance. So there's nudging someone out of their comfort zone into something that feels a little bit, you know, a little bit. But but I, I still think if it's the right path, there is something compelling you in that direction and you're just, you don't entirely feel comfortable with it. So mm-hmm. if somebody wanted me to wear more colors, I tend to wear almost exclusively like earth tone colors. If somebody wanted me to wear bo- like more colors and not just browns, I-, I could see how that could be of value to me. And so I might, I might start edging down the palette that way, okay. but I'm not going to suddenly show up somewhere in like a pumpkin orange head to toe outfit. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that's, I'm not going to feel comfortable. I'm not going to be any. So I think, I think, well, actually I skipped a point there. So one part of it is, is like edging out of your comfort zone rather yeah. than, but, but I can get excited about being, having more vivid colors or something versus the kind of resistance that comes out of that's not me. So, so like when I did that, um, the very first time I took the deadlift clean, the way I got into the strong woman competitions was I, I took a class at my gym, a clinic, because I wanted to, I was frustrated with the, with the hand dumbbells that I knew I could do heavier deadlifts, but my grip strength was a problem. And, and one of the trainers said, you know, we have a class with, with, for deadlifts that if you take the class, the clinic, we use the bar. And a lot of times people can lift a lot more with the bar. And then once you take the class, you can actually use the bar and not those. And I wanted to see where my upper limit of lifting was. So I took the class. Little did I know at the end of the class, there's this mock deadlift clinic where they, they pretend to, to do like a, a weightlifting championship at the end. Would I have ever signed up for that in a million years? Oh no. Like that was, that was definitely outside right. my comfort zone. But they edged you down the path. Well, and I had a little bit of a, a choice. Like, do I, you know, I would either have to just not show up, which would make me look like an idiot. So right. I, I did it, but, and I was kind of excited to do it, but just nervous. There's a difference between excited, but nervous out of your comfort zone. And, and then that ended up being a whole thing that I explored versus somebody asking me to do something that is just simply not me. Yeah. I, I think there's a big difference between out of my comfort zone and out of alignment with who I am. Like you're not, you're not resisting being playful because you're nervous or, 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 yeah. or like you're just, you're just not just don't think, playful. I like the way that you said that though, out of alignment with who you are, mm-hmm. because you can, you can walk a couple more steps down the path, but it's still aligned with how you want to present to the world and how you are. Mm-hmm. But then there are certain things where you know that this is just not me. Yeah. So, so when I look at, at business development, for example, I knew very early on, I was not the, and this is back in the heyday where a lot of lawyers did this. I was not the take your clients on a three day bender to Vegas kind of guy. (laughs) No, just that wasn't me. I also, you know, I could get out of my comfort zone and I could go golfing Mm -hmm. with them because I, I liked the conversation. I could learn to play golf and it turned out I didn't love that because it's so much time and all that. But 
I did learn that and I could and still having the conversations and it's more quiet time, but just doing something and being able to have discussions with clients that was in that was outside of my comfort zone, but it was still in alignment with who I was mm-hmm. getting people um, drunk and going out on the strip or wherever you go in Vegas. That's not I'm not that guy. Right. And so if, if some business development consultant was talking to you and they were trying to say, they, they, to take it back to sort of the beginning part, you know, they may say, oh, it's all the rage that this is the best way to get clients That's right That's what now, they were you know? actually saying. A lot right. of people were saying for the business we were going after, yes, take them out, show. do, this, tri- do yes. this trip and take your clients. And, and it worked for a lot of people. Right. And if, and if you were resist- resistant to that, I could imagine somebody saying like, oh, come on, get out of your comfort zone. That's not an out of your comfort zone thing. That's like, that's not fun for me in any way, shape or form. It's not just um, Mm -hmm. like like bolder. I I think bold is a good filter. Like if I think if something feels a little bolder than you are comfortable with, that's possibly, I mean, I could see some situations where it's not, but that's probably a good place where a good way that it's a stretch of a comfort zone difference versus if it's just not your thing. And, and and there's, it's funny, I, I originally told the I story just because I thought it was hysterical, but there is actually a tie here, which is, and, and the fact that I am using a makeup story as the foundational point metaphor that I'm using here nice. is kind Foundation. of hysterical. Oh, oh, check nice. me out. Oh, I wish no. I, oh, darn it. I wish I could claim I did that on purpose. Phooey. I ruined it. Um, But like accentuating my eyes, if we use my face as a metaphor for business, like accentuating my eyes is a good move. Putting red lipstick on on my personal lips is not the right move for my face. And it was actually kind of freeing to have that epiphany. And I was just Mm -hmm. laughing so hard because now after 20 years of trying trying on red lipsticks, I could just be like, you know what? That's not for me. My lips are not going to be those lips. (laughs) <laughs> right, but because you, you found the right red, and so if it would, I did. if it was going to work for you, it would work. It with would this. have worked that day, so that was really liberating. But I, but thinking about that, I'm like, how many times are you out there, like trying ten thousand reds of something, whether it's a marketing campaign or a, I don't know why it seems to uh, this applies so much to. Um, to, to business, but even like leadership trainings or whatever, like we're trying something over and over and over again. And so sometimes maybe it's not that thing. It's, it's like what's underneath, like maybe it's the wrong path altogether. Like maybe you're barking mm. up the wrong tree. No. And I, I see this a lot with people who come back from sales training Oh God! because yeah. there's so much coaching out there that says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to make up a list of prospects and potential referral sources and all that stuff. And then you're going to come back to me with a list every week. And I'm making up these numbers, but every week you're going to place 10 phone calls and ask five people out for coffee. And you're going to go out to, you know, two networking events. and You're going to target one trade association, whatever yep. it happens to be, yep. because these are very canned checklists of solutions. Mm-hmm. And then we're every person that walks in is the problem to which the same solution is going to be applied. Right. And I knew that I didn't want any part of that stuff because, you know, I don't love the Chamber of Commerce networking mm-hmm. thing. That's not what I do best. Yeah. I do other things that I, I found out what I do best and what I love to do. And this is how I get clients. But I see that so much in coaching, the applying our solution to whatever problem walks through the door. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned that because to take it one level up in the coaching world, there's an entire industry uh, that is that is comp- an entire industry formed around helping coaches with their business that that is very bad about that pattern where there'll be some guru person who's like, this is how you grow your practice. And I actually now have, and I took a lot of those classes. I tried a lot of those things. 99% of them did not work for me for the very reason we're talking about here. You know, very early on, I took one of those classes where they even give you the big binder about like, well, here's how you fill your mastermind. And I'll even give you all the emails I use and you Mm -hmm. can use them as like a mad lib and just put in your thing. Well, I tried that and guess what? didn't work for me. It was just for the exact same reason. Cause it wasn't my, it was my lips and not my eyes. You know, yeah. it was, it was like the wrong thing. And I now very, um, I don't know what's the word, not cynically. It's not the right word, but I watch on Facebook or social media or whatever. And I, I, it, it really cracks me up. I can tell when there's a new person in town because all of a sudden I will start seeing the same thing, whatever it is. I'll see all these people like, 
posting an open-ended question formatted in the same way that's like clearly supposed to get you to like respond in a way. Or you know how you see those things where they show you that um, how many of the news stations are owned by the same, they have the same script where they'll show you like 92 Mm -hmm. news people saying the same phrase. It sort of feels like that where all of a sudden on social media, all these coaches that I'm connected to or consultants will suddenly be posting like a slightly tweaked version of the exact same thing. You see that a lot on on. MLM stuff. Oh my God. Yes. You know, yes. whether it's the skincare or the weight loss or whatever it is, you yes. see the same because exact Because they've been patterns, handed yeah. like a template to use, which yes. I get it. You know I mean? Like I, I, building a business is a struggle. Like I definitely empathize with the want to have a template or a shortcut or just guidance. I mean, I think it's fair to want guidance, but you cannot take someone else's thing and slap it like a sticker on your business. You have to be able, you have to make it yours. And sometimes, sometimes what I ended up getting out a lot of that training that I signed up for was quickly learning what's not for me. Like what, what I, what I don't like and what doesn't work for me, which was helpful because that that works too. That is helpful. (laughs) The thing that I can, can say for sure is that if it's not right for you, if it's out of alignment with who you are, your audience can tell. Oh, yeah. So they can sniff it out a million miles away. I think it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. And and uncomfortable in the way that I've, I've joked around about from my architecture days background, the what I learned about ceiling height, that, you know, the, the ceiling height really affects someone's experience of a space, but no one ever walks into a room and says, Gosh, the ceiling height in here is no, perfect. They just, right, Nor do they say right. like, you know, I just feel like the ceiling height is off. Like they never notice the ceiling height. But they know the feel. But they'll, you know, and they'll say it's the paint color. I don't like this paint color. You know, like they'll, they'll attribute it to something else, but they'll just have this like sense of like, ew, like this doesn't, much like if you had a playful website. <laughs> much like if I had a playful website. <laughs> So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. (laughs) That is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. <laughs> we'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky Ooh, team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best Loving of ways. Lovingly snarky. Yes. <laughs> Good mockery. So, so a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, first, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. (laughs) Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story.